Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a lot to get through. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Wait till you hear what I've got to say. But now the leadership election is over, I, I tell you, we have to become a government in waiting. An election, an election could come at any time. Theresa May has said that she'll not be calling an early election. <laughs> but when, we, when could anyone trust the word of a Tory leader? <laughs> we have to prepare ourselves, not just for, to fight an election, but also for moving into government. So to do that successfully, we have to have the policies and the plans for implementation on the shelf in place for when we enter government, whenever that election comes. So everybody in the party, at every level, and in every role, needs to appreciate the sense of urgency of this task. So in this speech, I want to address some of the key issues we will face and how we'll face them. First, though, we need to appreciate the mess that the Tories are leaving behind when we go into government. Six years ago, six years on from when they promised to eliminate the government's deficit in five years, they're nowhere near that goal. The national debt burden was supposed to be falling by last year, and it's still rising. In money terms, it now stands at £1.6 trillion. Our productivity has fallen far behind. Each hour worked in the US or Germany or France is one-third more productive than each hour worked here. Our economy is failing on productivity because the Tories are failing to deliver the investment it needs. And government investment is still planned to fall in every year remaining of this Parliament. And in the real world, world economy that our people live in, wages are still lower than they were before the global financial crisis in 2008. There are now at least 800,000 people on zero-hour contracts, unable to plan from one week to the next, and the number continues to rise. There's nearly half a million in bogus self-employment. 86% of the austerity cuts have fallen on women. And tragically, there's nearly 4 million of our children living in poverty. This isn't right, is it? In the fifth richest economy in the world, poverty on that scale... So let's talk about the immediate issues facing us. On Brexit, we campaigned to remain, and we campaigned hard to remain, but we have to respect the decision of the referendum. But that doesn't mean we have to accept what the Tories serve up for our future relationship with Europe. Since Brexit, the Tories have come up with no plan whatsoever. They have no clue. Half of them want a hard Brexit to walk away from 30 years of investment in our relationship with Europe. Some are just paralysed by the scale of the mess they created. So what we'll do is we'll be working with our socialist and social democratic colleagues across Europe, and our aim is to create a new Europe, which builds upon the benefits of the EU but tackles the perceived disbenefits. I set out in Labour's red lines on the Brexit negotiations a few days after the vote. So let's get it straight. We have to protect jobs here, so we will seek to preserve access to the single market for goods and services. To <laughs> Today, access to the single market requires free movement of labour, but we'll address the concerns that people have raised in the undercutting of wages and conditions and the pressure on local public services. I tell you this, we will not let the Tories bargain away our workers' rights either. We will, we will defend the rights of EU nationals that live and work here and UK citizens currently living and working in Europe. We were, we were all appalled at the attacks that took place on the Polish community in our country following the Brexit vote. Let's be clear, as a party, we will always stand up against racism and xenophobia in any form. In the, in the, negotiations, in the negotiations, we want, also want Britain to keep its stake in the European Investment Bank. 
At the centre of the negotiations is Britain's financial services industry. Our financial services have been placed under threat as a result of the vote to leave. Labour has said clearly we will support access to European markets for the financial sector. But our financial services must understand that 2008 must never happen again. We must never... The message is clear to them. We will not tolerate a return to the casino economy that contributed to that crash ever again. We will support financial services where they deliver a clear benefit for the whole community, not just enriching a lucky few. We'll work with the finance sector to develop this new deal with finance for the British people. We'll fight for the best possible Brexit deal for the British people. And there'll be no more support for TTIP or any other trade deal that promotes deregulation or privatisation here or across Europe. And we'll make sure that any future Labour government has the power to intervene in our economy in the interests of the whole country. For Britain to prosper in that new Europe and on the world stage, our next major challenge is to call a halt to this government's austerity programme. The Conservatives... The Conservative Party built upon the disaster of the 2008 financial crisis by introducing an austerity programme that has made the impact of the economic crisis more prolonged, protected the corporations and the rich, and made the rest of society pay for the mistakes and greed of the speculators that caused the crash. Last year, this conference determined that this party would oppose austerity, and that's exactly what we've done. And we've had some successes. We forced the reversal of tax credit cuts. We also fought and won to have the personal independence payments cut scrapped. Sometimes, you know, sometimes, you know, in this movement we don't thank people enough. So I want to thank Owen Smith for the work he's done working with Jeremy to defeat the Tories on this issue. And I want to thank Angela Smith and her team in the Lords for the terrific work the Lords team has worked to defeat these Tories. So exactly as our economic adviser, Nobel Prize winner Joe Stiglitz said, we have to rewrite the rules of our economy. We will rewrite the rules to the benefit of working people on taxes, on investment and how our economic institutions work. So on tax, we know we can't run the best public services in the world on a flagging economy with a tax system that does not tax fairly or effectively. I want, to, I want to congratulate a group of people as well, and Jonathan Reynolds in particular, because the Christians on the left that he is a representative of came up with their slogan, the hashtag, Patriots Pay Their Taxes. It's a great slogan, Patriots Do Pay Their Taxes. Labour has already set the pace on tackling tax avoidance and tax evasion. We launched our tax transparency and enforcement programme to force the government into action. And again, I'd like to, I'd like to thank Rebecca Long-Bailey for leading the Labour charge in Parliament to hold the tax dodgers to account. She's been ably backed up by a new member of our team, Peter Dowd, who's again stepped into the breach and fought in Parliament for every principle that we've put forward. And I want to congratulate Caroline Flint, who forced an amendment to the Finance Bill to ensure country-by-country -country reporting is now back on the agenda. The publication of the Panama Papers threw just some light on the scale of tax evasion and tax avoidance. Some of the largest firms in the City of London are up to, it, up to their necks in it. HSBC alone accounted for more than 2,300 shell companies established to help the super-rich duck their taxes. In government, 
we will end the scourge of tax avoidance. We will end it. We will, we will, create, we will create a new tax enforcement unit at HMRC, doubling the number of staff investigating wealthy tax avoiders. We'll, we will ban tax dodging companies from winning public sector contracts. And we'll, and we'll ensure that all British Crown dependencies and overseas territories introduce a full public register of company owners and beneficiaries. We will throw light on where the tax dodgers are hiding their money. Our review, our review of HMRC has also exposed the corporate capture of the tax system and how staff cutbacks are undermining our ability to collect the taxes we need. I want to thank PCS The Union, Professor Prem Seeker, John Christensen and their team for the expertise they provided us in drawing up this review. The next, the next stage will be to develop the legislation and international agreements needed to close tax havens and end tax abuse. And I'll give you this assurance. When we go back into government, we'll make sure HMRC has the staffing, the resources and the legal powers to close down the tax avoidance industry that has grown up so aggressively in this country. We, but we have to do more than stop tax avoidance. The burden of taxation as a whole now falls too heavily on those least able to pay. So let me make it clear, in this coming period, we will be developing the policies that will shift the tax burden more fairly away from those who earn wages and salaries and onto those who hold wealth. <laughs> Turning to investment, as I've said before, Labour as a party of government needs to think not just about how we spend money, but how we earn it. I've announced a £250 billion investment programme that will ensure no community is left behind. This is the scale of investment that independent experts say will start to bring Britain's infrastructure into the 21st century. It means putting the investment in place that will transform our energy system, providing cheap, low carbon electricity. It means ensuring that every part of the country has access to super-fast broadband matching the best in the world. It means delivering the transport improvements, including HS3 in the north of England, that will unlock the potential of the whole country. But for too long now, major decisions about what and where to invest have been taken by Whitehall and the city. The result? Underinvestment and decline across the country. So it's time for our regions and localities to take control, take back control. So we will create new institutions not run by the old elite circles. Our £250 billion National Investment Bank will supply the long-term patient investment needed to sustain a new, more productive economy. It will be backed up by a network of regional development banks with a clear-cut mandate to supply finance to regional and local economies. It's a disgrace also that our small businesses can't get the finances they need to grow. Our financial system is letting them down badly at present. The new regional development banks will have a mandate to provide the patient long-term investment they need. But we'll go further than this. We'll shake up how our major corporations work and change how our economy is owned and managed. We'll clamp down on the abuses of power at the very top. Under Labour, there'll be no more Philip Greens at all. We will legislate. We will... We will legislate to rewrite company law to prevent them. We will introduce legislation to ban companies taking on excessive debt to pay out dividends to shareholders. And we will and we'll, we'll rewrite the tax takeover, the takeover code to make sure every takeover proposal has a clear plan in place to pay workers and pensioners. We will protect their pensions. But we can do more to transform our economy for working people. Theresa May has spoken about worker representation on boards. Well, it's good 
to see her following our lead. But we know that when workers own and manage their companies, those businesses last longer and are more productive. If we want patient long-term investment in high-quality firms, what better way to do it than to give employees themselves a clear stake in both? So cooperation and collaboration is how emer the emerging economy of the future functions. So we'll look at to at least double our cooperative sector in this country so that it matches those in Germany and the US. We'll, we'll, build, we'll build on the good example of Labour councils like Preston here in the Northwest, using public procurement to support cooperatives wherever they can. And yes, we'll cr help create 200 local energy companies and 1,000 energy cooperatives, giving power back to local communities and breaking the monopoly of the big six producers. We'll, we'll introduce a right to own, giving workers first refusal on a, pro on a proposal for worker ownership when a company faces change of ownership or closure. A right to own for workers' security. So the next... So the next Labour government will promote a renaissance in cooperative and worker ownership. The new regional development banks will be tasked with supplying the capital a new generation of business owners will need to succeed. We'll support business hubs across the country. I visited Make Liverpool yesterday, where an abandoned warehouse is being turned into a shared workshop space for small businesses and the self-employed. The next Labour government will provide support to establish business hubs in every town and city every town and city. We know, we know the economy is changing with more people self-employed than ever before. We need to think creatively about how to respond. So we'll be taking a serious look at how to make the welfare system better support the self-employed. But I'm also interested in the potential of a universal basic income. And I want to learn from the, from the experiments that are taking place across Europe. But you know, until working people have proper protections at work, the labour market will always work against them. So achieve fair wages, the next Labour government will look to implement the recommendations of the Institute of Employment Relations report. We'll, we'll reintroduce sectoral collective bargaining across the economy, ending the race to the bottom. And I give you this commitment, in the first 100 days of our Labour government, we'll repeal the Trade Union Act. Because, because what happens when trade unions are weakened? I'll tell you what happens. Over 200,000 workers in the UK are receiving less than the minimum wage set down in law. This is totally unacceptable. Under Labour, we will properly resource HMRC and the gang masters and labour abuse authority to make sure there are no more national scandals like Mike Ashley of Sports Direct. <laughs> and, our, and our vision for a high wage economy with everyone receiving their fair dues does not end there. I've spoken before about building on the great achievements of previous Labour governments. Yes, and one of the greatest achievements of the government elected in 1997 was the establishment of a national minimum wage, lifting millions out of poverty. And I pay tribute to that government for doing it. But remember, Remember, the Tories opposed it, claiming it would cost millions of jobs. But, united in purpose, we won the argument. Under the next Labour government, everyone will earn enough to live on. When we win the next election, we will write into law a real living wage. We'll charge a new living wage review body with the task of setting it at the level needed for a decent life. 
independent forecasts suggest that this will be over £10 an hour. <laughs> this, will, this will be part of our new bargain in the workplace. But we know that small businesses need to be part of that bargain, and that's why we'll also be publishing proposals to help businesses implement the living wage, particularly small and medium-sized companies. We'll be examining a number of ideas, including the expansion and reform of employment allowance to make sure that this historic step forward, improving the living standards of the poorest paid, does not impact upon hours of employment. Backed up by our commitment to investment, this means we will end the scourge of poverty pay in this country, once and for all. The decent... We've said this before, but decent pay is not just fundamentally right, it's actually good for business. It's good for employees and it's good for Britain. But we need a new deal across the whole of our economy. Because whatever we do in Britain, the old rules of the global economy are being rewritten for us. The winds of globalisation are blowing in a different direction now. They're blowing against the belief in the free market and in favour of intervention. Look at the steel crisis. With the world market flooded by cheap steel, major governments moved to protect their domestic steel industries. Ours did not, until we pushed them into it as a result of a community and trade union and labour campaign. But they're so blinkered by their ideology that they can't see how the world is changing. Good business doesn't need no government. Good business needs good government. And the best, go the best governments today, right the way across the world, recognise that they need to support their economies because the way the world, wor the world works is changing. For decades, manufacturing jobs disappeared as producers looked for the cheapest labour they could find. Today, one in six manufacturers in the UK are bringing jobs back to Britain. That's because production today is about locating close to markets and drawing upon the highly skilled labour and high quality investment. Digital technology means production can be smaller scale, in smaller, faster firms, dependent on cooperation and, not collab and collaboration, not dog-eat-dog -dog competition. The economies that are making best use of this shift are those with governments that understand it's taking place and support new industries and small businesses. You know, we could be part of that change here. There's huge potential in this country and in every part of the country. We have an immense heritage of scientific research and engineering expertise. Today our science system is a world leader. We have natural resources that could make us world leaders in renewables. We have talent and ambition in every part of the country. Yet at every stage, we have a government that fails to reach that potential. It's cut scientific research spending. It's slashed subsidies to renewables, threatening tens of thousands of jobs. And it plans to cut essential public investment in transport, energy and housing across the whole country. Be certain, the next Labour government will be an interventionist government. We will not stand by like this one and see our key industries flounder and our future prosperity put at risk. Like Rebecca Long Bailey has said, when we return to government, we'll implement a comprehensive industrial strategy developed in partnership with trade unions and employers and the wider community. After Brexit, we want to see a renaissance in British manufacturing. And as we've committed ourselves, our government will create an entrepreneurial state that works with wealth creators, the workers and the entrepreneurs, to create the products and the markets that will secure our long-term prosperity. Let me just say this in conclusion on a personal note. I'm so, I'm so pleased that this conference is being held in Liverpool. I was born in this city, not, for, not far from here. My dad was a Liverpool docker and my mum was a cleaner and then worked for 30 years behind a BHS store counter. I was part of that 1960 generation. We lived in what sociological studies have described as some of the worst slum conditions that existed within this country. We just called it home. <laughs> As a result of a Labour government, I remember the day when we celebrated moving into our council house. My brother and I had a bedroom on our own for the first time, a garden front and re rear. Both of us were born in NHS hospitals. Both of us had a great free education. There was an atmosphere of eternal optimism. 
our generation always thought that from here on there would always be a steady improvement in people's living standards. We expected the lives of each generation would improve upon the last. But successive Tories governments put an end to that. Under Jeremy's leadership, I believe that we can restore that optimism, people's faith in the future. So I say this, in the birthplace of John Lennon, it forced to us to inspire people to imagine again. Imagine the society. <clears throat> imagine. Imagine the society we, we can create. It's a society that's radically transformed, radically fairer, more equal, more democratic. Yes, based upon a prosperous economy that's economically and environmentally sustainable, but where that prosperity is shared by all. That's our vision to rebuild and transform Britain. In this party, you no longer have to whisper its name. It's called socialism. Solidarity.